So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. So we are in week five of You Asked For It. This, today, we're going to talk about uh, Help Me Discover My Purpose. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, my, my family right now, we, we just recently moved, and uh, all my stuff is in an outbuilding on my property. And, uh, and then stuff going on with... Uh, with my stepdad, and, and we talked last week about pressure, right? That pressure sometimes slips into stress, but that God ordains and authors pressure. And, and it's in times of pressure that you want to believe that God has a purpose. Purposeless pressure is very difficult to deal with, but we claim in the midst of these things that God is good and kind and faithful. I can look over my shoulder and see it. I can look in my future and believe it. And so we are trying to do that. But I want to talk to you about about purpose today. It's one of my favorite topics because uh, there's a number of questions that I still have about the Bible and about the church and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. I feel like every time that I turn over a stone in the Bible, another one flips over, right? It's, it's a living book. It's a powerful book. And so I, I feel like I'm always growing. God's always challenging me. But I'll tell you one thing that I'm very, very secure and cemented on, and that's that God created you on purpose and toward purpose. And so for some of you, you walked in here today, and I know for an absolute fact that you've got things going on in your life or have gone on in your past that you question whether or not God has a future for you. And so I'm just going to ask you to do two things. Number one is I'm just going to ask you to take five seconds and say, God, I need you to speak to me today. And number two, I need you that if you don't have faith for yourself, just borrow mine in the next few minutes, okay? And let's trust that God has something good for us. Purpose is, uh, is something that is is both in the here and now and something that's in the future. And so I read a, 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 an article a couple months ago about a rabbit at a greyhound track. You know what I'm talking about? You, you didn't think that those dogs were just gladly running around that track, right? There's actually an electronic rabbit that they are chasing. That's the way that they get them to run. And there was a track in New York that uh, the, the rabbit was going and the dogs were chasing and everything was going fine. And then the rabbit malfunctioned and exploded, Okay. And it, and it was interesting because what the guy talked about wasn't the, the response of the audience, but the response of the dogs. And there was a couple dogs who uh, just began to run indiscriminately in all kinds of directions. One actually ran through railing and broke some of his ribs. If you're a dog person, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, I didn't break his ribs. Don't send me an email, okay? Uh, there, was, there was a group of dogs that just started, sat down and like started barking and yelling at the audience. And, uh, and then most of them just kind of sat down. Let me say it to you this way. None of them finished the race, not one. And I've been a pastor for almost 20 years now. And what I have noticed is that when we don't have something transcendent out in front of us, we do exactly what those dogs did. When you don't have purpose, you tend to, I tend to run in indiscriminate directions because anything is an opportunity or anything is a possibility. And sometimes that direction runs me squarely into a wall. Sometimes it runs me out into a field, but it's not, not as focused as it needs to be. I've also noticed that people without purpose tend to be hating on people with purpose because people without purpose don't have something higher and better to you know, occupy their time. And so they literally have nothing better to do. And so if you get in a fight with somebody over a sports team, not only do you need counseling, but you need purpose. <laughs> because if you knew the reason that God put you on this planet, you wouldn't care what happened on a football field as much as you do. Let me say it to you this way. I think that the thing that's happening in our political system right now isn't that we are necessarily so vitriolic and want different things. I, I understand there's important reasons. But when I watch some of y'all on Facebook, what I think is, don't you have something better to do? Don't you have something better to do with your time and with your social media account than talk about all the things you hate about the opposite party? It's really a lack of purpose. And what you're really doing is what those dogs are doing. You're just howling at an audience that doesn't know you and doesn't care. And so I want to save you today from doing that. And, I, and I, I'm saying it a little bit comedically, but a little bit not. Because what I have noticed is that people who have purpose live differently than those who don't. 
And what I have also noticed is that most of us, are, we are enduring life. We're not winning it. Because we don't have something that we are chasing that God put specifically in front of us. And so I want you to stand up and I want to show you what God says is his plan for you. And I promise you that when you read this, you're going to say, nah. So that's why I said before, ask the Lord to speak to you and borrow my faith until it becomes yours. Here we go. Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. Stop. Not you would be if. Not too bad you did something then and you can't. No. You are in the here and now. Because of who Jesus is, you, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is God's plan for you, is to be a light in the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. That's what God wants for you. To be a light in the house that you call Kansas City. To be a light in the neighborhood that you reside. To be a light in the workplace that you are. To be a light in your relationships. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And let me show you what happens with this. The book of Proverbs. Where there is no prophetic vision, people cast off restraints. There's a paraphrase that says, where there is no vision, people stumble about. When I'm not chasing something... I'm walking in the dark. When I'm not chasing something, I tend to get distracted when I shouldn't. I tend to care about things that I shouldn't. I tend to get engaged in things that I shouldn't. And so here's what we need from God, to be able to see correctly so that we can keep his law. I want to see correctly. Who am I, God? What do you have for me today? Let's pray. God, I come to you, and I thank you for this word that you have for us. God, the truth is that when you created us, you created us perfectly purposely, toward transcendence, toward making a difference. You created us on purpose, with purpose, toward purpose. And the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy. And you want to give us abundance and life. You want us to wake up tomorrow in the belief that we can not only be a part of what you're doing in the here and now, but we can change eternity and build your kingdom. We can make it hard to go to hell from Kansas City. And so God, I pray today that you would encourage those of us who need to be encouraged clarify for those of us that need to have clarification, give vision to those of us who are cloudy, and help us walk out of here with wind in our sails, God. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So here's what I want to say to you. Vision brings focus. Vision brings focus. When I can see who I am, when I can see where God is at work, when I can see the purpose that God has for me, it brings focus. It brings endurance. Some of us, the reason that we're tired is that we have an indifference about the life that we're leading. You're not waking up excited about what God's going to do, excited about what God's going to say, excited about how God's going to use you. And vision brings fulfillment. It brings fulfillment to know that tomorrow morning, the God of the universe, I'm his favorite. You're his favorite too. I'm his favorite. His mercy is new to me this morning. His spirit wants to speak to me and dwell me and lead me for purposes that will extend not only this day, but this week, but this month, but this year, but my lifetime. Come on, somebody. Whatever about the Chiefs game, right? Whatever about the playoffs, whatever about the, the news, what, like, this is what we want. And this is what God gives us. And what I've noticed is that most of us have an easier time seeing it for somebody else than we do for ourselves. I have an easier time seeing it for you than I do for me because I know me, right? I I know my warts. I know my weaknesses. I know my past. I have my regrets. And the enemy doesn't speak doubt into my mind about you. He speaks doubt into my mind about me. And the same is true about you. And so what I want to do today is I want to... I want God's word to speak into your heart about what he intends to do in spite of what has been, in spite of your warts, in spite of your weaknesses. And what I actually want you to see is that I think that God wants to use the very things that you're embarrassed about for his glory and kingdom. I think that God has that for you. And so I want to declare four statements over you. And I want to start in the book of Isaiah. And I want you to see what God said to Isaiah about Isaiah. And I want you to imagine how Isaiah felt whenever God said this to him. Number one, he says, Isaiah, I want you to get up, son. I want to say to some of you, come on. Right? Come Okay. I get it. Okay. There's a lot going on. I get it. Uh, I get what your past was. I get what they said. I get... I get that you're mad. I get, I get that you're discouraged. I get, hey, it, it's time to get up. 
It's time to get up. It's time to get up, and it's time to start shining again. Some of you, you have lost your shine. And it's time to arise, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. God doesn't say this as a potential for Isaiah. He says it as a reality for Isaiah. And I think it's a reality for you and I. That what God says is true about you, it's time for some of us to get up. It's time for us to start again, to believe again, to trust again, to hope again, to grow in faith again, to walk across the street again. Arise because the glory of God is upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. Right? I mean, did you watch the news this weekend? Come on, man. Really? Darkness covers the earth and a thick darkness on the people. And there was nobody who were involved in what happened this weekend that weren't impacted by darkness, right? I mean, it was all over the place. But the Lord will arise on you. The Lord will arise on you and will give his glory to be seen upon you. And the nation shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. And I imagine that when God said this to Isaiah, that he was like, what? Because when, when you come to God with a submitted humility, God will say things about you that you can't imagine to be true and wouldn't be true if it weren't for him in you. But the other reality of it is, is that some of us forget the fact that it is God who does these things, and so we live beneath the potential that comes with him in dwelling us, leading us, sustaining us, and directing us. And so God comes to Isaiah and says, Ike, <clears throat> here's the thing, bro. I need you to stand up. I need you to get to it. I need you to understand who you are. I need you to understand what I want to do. I understand where you are, but I need you to understand the purpose that I created you for. And so I'm going to make four statements over you today, and I'm going to say them in first person because I want you to say them in first person, and I want to explain them to you. The first is this. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. And you say, yeah, you are a minister. I'm a plumber. That's not what I mean, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about you have a ministry. You have a ministry. You have something that God, a, a mantle, an anointing that God has put specifically and uniquely on you to do a work that only you were created to do. Here's what the Bible says. You, you are a chosen race. God wanted you. God can have whatever he wants. He wanted, he wanted you, and he wanted me, and he wanted us, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you, why? That you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. You are called into the ministry. You are called to mission. You are called to purpose. In the declaration of the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. If you are in here today and there was a point at which you used to be blind, but now you see, that's you. That's you. If you're in here today and God saw fit to save you like he saw fit to save me on October 18th, 1994, that's me. That's me. And I love who wrote this, Peter, right? Because Peter was a knucklehead. Because Peter said stuff he shouldn't have said, did stuff he shouldn't have done, had a past, got distracted, barked at the crowd, ran through the railing, and he's like, hey, this is who you are. Stand up. Shine. You got a ministry. This is what God says is true about you. Number two, you are a minister with a specific purpose. A minister with a specific purpose. Look what the Bible says. We, you, me, are his workmanship. God is working on you and in you and through you, created in Christ Jesus for good works. There are works that all of us are called to do. We are called to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen? We're called to go into all nations to make disciples, to baptize, to plant churches, to make sure that the name and fame of Jesus exceeds our lifetime and our location. You're called to do that. You're called to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor in the same way that you take care of yourself, take care of your neighbor. Be a part of making Kansas City the best place in the world to live because Jesus is the one who's ordaining and directing. You're called to that. We're all called to that, but there are specific things that only you are called to do. There are specific things that only you are built to do. There are specific things that only you are gifted to do, and that if you don't do them, we'll all lose them. 
God says, he's working on you, creating you two good works, which God prepared before that you should walk in them. In other words, God, you came pre-packaged with these things. You came pre-created with these things. You came pre-blessed with these things. You were a minister with a ministry, a specific ministry, a specific purpose at an opportune time. I hate it when Christians talk about how messed up culture is, how messed up the world is, how dark times are, all that kind of thing. Because most of the time, we're saying that in an oppressive kind of way, right? We're saying that like, oh, shoulders down, groaning and whining and fussing and all that kind of thing. Look at what the Bible says. Look carefully at how you walk. Don't be unwise. Be wise. Make the best use of the time because the days are evil. God says, look, I know it's messed up. I saw what was on Facebook. I watched the news. Make the best use of the time that God puts you in. You know, God could have put you in a different generation. God could have put you in a different city. God could have put you in a different place. God could have given you a different family, a different background. God could have given you a different ethnicity. God made you you and put you here now when the world is what it is so that you can stand up in the midst of it, so that you can make a difference in the midst of what it is, not in what it should be. It's not ever going to be what it should be until Jesus comes back and makes it what it should be. But until that point... Stand up. Stop whining. It's dark. Yep, it's dark. Yep, it's divided. Yep, it's segregated. Yep, it's not right. Yep, it's beneath justice. Who is it that God put here to do something about it? And so let's stop tying our wagons to politicians. Let's stop freaking out every midterm and full term. Let's stop going on Facebook, making much about a king whose name isn't Jesus. You are just adding to the darkness. You're just adding to the argument. You're just adding to, you are being unwise. I'm not asking you to make good use. I'm asking you to make the best use of the time that God sovereignly puts you in. You say, well, I hate our president. Do something about it. While the Senate, do something about it. Well, our city, do something about it. Well, the church, do something about it. Stand up. Arise and live like God says that you are. Be who God says that you are, that God created you on purpose and toward purpose, and that if you shrink from it, we all lose it. Are you out there today? I believe this with all of my heart. I don't even need to know you to know this is true about you. And I don't need to know you to know that the enemy will do everything he he can to squash this in you. So I want to put some fire in your belly of just stop. Best time, best use in this time. What's your ministry? What's the good work? What's the best way to do it? Let's stop whining about it and let's get to it. Okay? Why? To make an internal difference. Can I tell you, um, our church is 75 years old. And that makes it... uh, an old woman compared to most churches. You know that the church is a woman, by the way. Sorry, dudes. Church is a woman. She's a, she's a beautiful old lady. But, uh, but I can tell you, compared to where we are going, she's just getting started. Okay, 75 years isn't that long of a time in the grand scheme of things. It's long compared to what is happening in the rest of the Western church. But, but Pastor John and I, we talk about this a lot. We talk about, God, would you allow us to see a church built here that isn't just for this generation? I love y'all. I'm glad you're here. But but what would it be? What what is this church going to look like in 150 years? I don't know what the world's going to look like. And look at me. I don't care. Because I know who God is. And because I know what God calls us to. And because I know that the darker it gets isn't to discourage the Christian. It's to call the Christian to stand up in light. And so I'm I'm, I'm wondering what, what gifts you're going to bring, what ministry you're going to bring in this time and in this place that's going to make this church generationally healthier and glorifying to God. You're in here and you're under 25. You're really not next gen. You're this gen. You're just going to be here longer than the rest of us. And one day, I'm going to be standing before Jesus, and there, one of you might be the person standing on this stage. What, what are you doing in the here and now to become that? What are you doing in the here and now to become that? 
And for some of you, because, because you don't have purpose, because you aren't walking with God, you're distracted by things you shouldn't be distracted by. You're running through walls you shouldn't be running through. You're saying things you shouldn't, because you're barking at people you shouldn't be barking at, because you don't really believe that God loves you enough to make every single day count for his glory. And so to make an eternal difference, God says your gifts can make heaven different. And your lack of use of those gifts can make hell different. To make a difference, to make heaven bigger, to make it hard to go to hell from Kansas City. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, investing in the spiritual kingdom, they can also use wood, hand, stubble. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. What sort of work is God calling you to do? What sort of work is God, minister is God calling you to be? Not then, not would have been if this hadn't happened, now. Now. And God isn't just saying, stay away from bad stuff. God's saying, build something of beauty. Make a difference. Make a difference. Figure out your purpose. Discover your purpose and make a difference. And if you're going to discover your purpose and make a difference, you're going to need friendship. So find friends. And if you're going to discover your purpose and make a difference, you're going to need friends. You're going to need to know God. You're not going to just going to need to know about God. You're going to need to enjoy God. You're going to need to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength so you can love your neighbor well, so you can make a difference, not just in 2018, but in 3018. And if Jesus doesn't come back, I want this church to be more beautiful then than it is today. How do I then find my ministry? You say, okay, okay, okay. okay. Just ranting and raving about all these things. How do I do this? How do I do this? First is this. I want you to understand that your gifts are given to you by God, but not for you. So he, God, gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain unity of faith, Knowledge of the Son of God, mature manhood, adulthood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so, not only is it, is it who, me, but it's also we need everybody, right? It, it is you, all of us. You say, well, my gifts aren't that. Every gift is important. Every gift is necessary. Listen, there is no appendix in the body of Christ. We'll just take that out. Every single gift Every single person is necessary for the work of the ministry, for the equipping of the saints, for the building up of the church to all of these purposes. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. And so how do you find your gifts? Number one, I want you to consider your gifts and your passions. So let me define for you what a spiritual gift is. Gifts are things, abilities that God gives you by his grace. You don't earn it. You, you, you don't, you're not moral enough and then God gives it to you. God gives it to you out of his grace. He provides it to you at the time of your conversion. And so if you're in here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have spiritual gifts. You need a savior. You don't have supernatural spiritual gifts because God has not yet made you alive through the person and work of Jesus. And so you say, I like this idea of spiritual gifts. Let me introduce you to somebody who can give them to you. But your spiritual gifts are three things. It's something that you love to do. Something that you love to do. When you do it, you love doing it. Let me give you an example. Pastor Brandon has a great time leading worship here every Sunday. You can tell, right? He enjoys whenever he is operating in his gifting. Number two, you enjoy when he's operating in his gifting. And so I love to do it, and church, the church loves when you do it. And so let me say it to you this way. Some of you, you say, I love to sing. And we say, <laughs> God bless you. We say, I don't think that's your spiritual gift. Because a spiritual gift is something that God gives you for your blessing, that God gives, gives you, you your gift for our blessing. And so I love doing it, and you love when I do it, and it works when I do it, because God doesn't give you broke stuff. God doesn't give you a gift and say, uh, this is a refurbished version. 
Let's see how it goes. And so if you say, I have the gift of leadership, what's the question? Who are you leading? I have the gift of evangelism. When's the last time you led somebody to Jesus? Well, in 1980, no, that's not your gift. Keep looking. Keep looking. Your gifts are things you love to do. What do you love to do? Your gifts are things that people love when you do them. What's the last thing that somebody repetitively asks you to do? And your gifts are things that in the spiritual realm work when you do them. Let me show you some verses here. Having gifts that differ. Okay, so yes, you. Yes, all of us. We all have gifts. We all have different gifts. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And this is why I talk to you so much about the difference between active knowledge and active obedience. I understand that there are some things that you need to know in order to obey. But some of us, you know enough, it's time to stand up. You know enough. Some of us, you have enough clarity to take a step. I need you to start using your gifts. And I will tell you this, that you will not understand your gifts until you're trying to use your gifts. Because God often will give you what you need as you go to use what he's given you. And so some of you say, as you're sitting there, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And God's saying, stand up and I'll tell you as you're heading there. We all have gifts, we're all called, we're all called to this time and to this place to make an eternal difference. Use them. If prophecy, do it in proportion to your faith. If service, then in your serving. If teaching, in his teaching. If exhortation, in his exhorting. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here's what God says. Find out what your gift, gift is and then smash it. Right? Find out what your gift is and then bless everybody you know with it. Find out what your gift is and run as hard and as fast and as long as you can in that lane. And I will bless you and lead you and provide for you and give you endurance and fulfill you and kingdom will look different because of me in you. But come on, come on, get up. You know enough. Come on, get up. I know what happened. God's bigger than that. Come on, get up. I know you're insecure. God's bigger than that. Hey, I, I know you're an introvert. God can give you the energy. Hey, I know what happened. Uh, just come on, come on. The enemy will give you all the excuses that you need. God gives you one truth. And the question is whether or not you're going to stand up in the middle of that. And so what are your gifts? What are your passions? What do you love to do? When you think about church, what do you think about? I'll tell you, I think about leaders. I think about leaders when I think about church. And I think about teaching and equipping when I think about church. Some of you think about kids when you think about church. Some of you think about music. Some of you think about hospitality. Some of you think about food. I think about food when I think about church too. <laughs> Eating your food mostly. Yeah. What do you think about when you think about what the church should be? It would be amazing if the church, that's, you're getting there. You're getting there. What are your, what are your gifts? What are your passions? What is your experience? What is your experience? The Bible asks us to do, to present by the mercy of God our bodies. The, the, the Greek there is everything that happens in. Present everything that happens in, has happened in your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so let me ask you some questions. What, talk to me about, about what makes you you, uniquely you. Talk to me about things that have happened to you. Talk to me about the family you grew up in. Talk to me about your personality. I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I uh, am task-oriented. I'm people-oriented. I'm decision-oriented. I like options. Talk to me about your training. Well, I got a degree in. Your mentors. Talk to me about your relationships. And, and here's how I want you to think through this. All the things that make you you and your body... God has authored or allowed as a part of his sovereign plan. It's important that you believe that. Everything that makes you you, the good, the bad, the ugly, the things you're embarrassed about, the secrets that you keep, God has authored or allowed as a part of his sovereign plan. And if you'll consider 
them being under his sovereignty, that sovereign plan will soon give way to his sovereign purpose. When I think about even the events that brought me to Kansas City, I'll tell you, this, is, this has been one of the most stressful, pressure-filled, clarifying, grace-providing, wind-providing experiences of my life because this is the first place that I have been and that I'm going to be that I can look over my shoulder and say, oh, that's why. That's why you took me to Cincinnati. That's why you took me to Madison. That's why you took me to India. And here's the thing. At the time, I wasn't perfectly sure that God was doing those things. And this is why I say, you will get clarity and provision as you actively obey, not as you sit and wait. And so, God, I'm going st- to arise, and I'm going to walk it out, and I'm going to trust that your sovereign plan is giving way to your sovereign purpose, and there will come a point where I'll go, aha, that's the ministry that you've been forming in me. That's the difference that you want me to make. That's, that's the gifts that you've given me. And you begin to step out into those things. And so what makes you you? What's happened to you? What is your experience? And then here's the last one that we often forget. Talk to me about the things that have gone wrong. Talk to me about the things that you wish hadn't happened. Talk to me about the things you regret, the things that people have done to you. Look look at this verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Stop. Amen? The fact that God is near to the brokenhearted. The fact that God knows what happened. The fact that God grieves that it happened. The fact that God cares what it happened. The fact that God will, in his way, in his time, in his place, bring justice to what happened. Romans chapter 12. Amen? God does that. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we have ourselves been comforted by God. God says, I know that there are things that have happened. I grieve them with you, and I comfort you in them, and I want you to give the comfort that I give you to somebody else who's experiencing the same thing. How about if I say it to you this way? Can I tell you that the best uh, grief counselors aren't people who have had a perfect life? They're people who have experienced tragedy. Can I tell you that the best marriage counselors are people who have been divorced, and God has restored them? Can I tell you that the best financial counselors are people who have gone bankrupt? I have a buddy. He grew up on the West Coast and uh, grew up in a broken home, a violent home. And he grew up, he was a street fighter, got paid to beat people and uh, dealt drugs and very promiscuous lifestyle and God saved him. And now he's a pastor. And do you know what his congregation looks like? Thugs, hoods. Street fighters, drug dealers, people having sex. Why? Because God had a plan that gave way to a purpose. I have a friend who is a lieutenant in the Marines, one of the most tender-hearted, sweet-hearted, brilliant guys that I've ever met. And he went, felt like God wanted him to go in the Marines. And he became a lieutenant, and he went over to Afghanistan and led a group of soldiers and experienced incredible trauma and came back with PTSD. And I sat across from him at a Mexican restaurant, and I listened to him, and that tender heart had been replaced with a lot of cynicism and a lot of grief and a lot of hurt and a lot of confusion. And I was getting mad sitting there listening to him because I'm like, God, why would you do this to this guy? And in the midst of the darkness, there was a couple pin pops of light that this guy was going to get his master's degree in counseling so he could help vets coming back with PTSD. Can I tell you, I could have never had that ministry because I never went through what he went through. And so the enemy wants to say to you that there are things that you have done that have ruined you. Look at me. It's not true. There are things that they did that disqualified you. It's not true. In fact, the things that you're the most embarrassed by are probably the things that God most wants to use so he can say, look at the length I will go to redeem somebody, to save somebody, to restore somebody, to comfort somebody. But we have this thing in the church that is, if God's using you, you'll look a certain way. You'll dress a certain way. You'll vote for a certain person. Stop it. That's ridiculous. Read your Bible. 
God used knuckleheads and murderers and mouthy idiots and doubters who were willing to stand up and keep walking, who believed that there was a God in heaven who loved them, who believed that he knew them, who created them on purpose and toward purpose, and that nothing they did could stop him from bringing it to pass. God's not done with you until you're standing in front of him. God's not done with you. I don't even need to know what happened or what you did. I know him. And for some of you, the word for you today is God created you on purpose still. Still. Your pain, your experience, your gifts, your passions. So how do we, how do, we do this? Uh, I love this verse. For we, say it, we know. We know. And I hope that you know, not I, we hope it'd be great if. No, we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I heard a preacher the other day making fun of this. Listen, you have no hope if the terrible things that have happened cannot be redeemed by God. You have no hope. If God is not bigger than your brokenness, you have no hope. God is bigger, we know. Love him and he will work all things together for your good when you are called according to what? There are things that have happened in my life that at the time I was like, God, how dare you? And now I look back and I say, God, thank you. You expanded me in that. You broke me and you expanded me in that. You grew me in that. You humbled me in that. You taught me in that. I would have never chosen to go that way. I don't want to go back that way. But thank you that you walked with me through that way according to the purposes that you've called me to. One person agrees with me. And I'm glad. (laughs) It's very difficult, guys, to evaluate pain redemptively if you don't understand that God has created you toward transcendent purpose. It's very difficult. If you don't believe that God is sovereign and creates you on purpose and toward purpose, there will be things that happen to you and and you won't have a place to put them. And so when you say, help me with my purpose, I want to also help you with a place to put the bad things that have happened. It's in Romans 8, 28. How do we do this? Stepping into my purpose, I'm going to give you three things. Number one, what am I doing that I need to stop. What, what are the things that, that I'm doing that if I continue to do them, it will keep me from God's best purposes in my life? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing, you might discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let your eyes look directly forward not over your shoulder into your past. Directly forward. Let your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then what? all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. What are you doing right now that you know if I keep doing this, I'm not going to experience everything that God has for me? And I want to tell you something. It's not always sinful Sometimes it's a good thing. It's just not the best thing, the thing that God created you for. And so what are you doing that you need to stop? And then what am I, it should, be, it should say, what am I not doing that I need to be doing? So what am I doing that I need to stop? And what am I not doing that I need to start? Look at what the Bible says, James 4, 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do. And some of you, God has spoken a word over you, and you know it was him, and you know what you need to do next, And for whatever reason, you're not doing it. So here's what he says. If you know what God has spoken over you and you fail to do it, for him it is sin. Sometimes in church, we say that sin is the thou shalt nots. Sin is just stop. Stop it. Don't do that. Don't smile about it. Don't go to that movie. Don't drink, smoke, chew, or go with girls that do, and you'll be good. And people live their lives only orienting themselves to not doing bad things. But here's what God says. There are also good things that if you don't do them, that's sin too. Some of you, you know what God created you for. 
You know that God loves you. You know that God has a plan for your life. And you think that your, your passiveness, that your wilting away, that you're sitting when you should be standing, that God just passes over it. God says, that's actually more frustrating, I think, than just that you're not following the rules. I built you for more than this. I created you for more than this. And so here's the question. If you know, why not do it today? <laughs> if you know that there are things that you need to stop doing, stop today. If you know that there are things that you should be doing that you aren't, start them today. You say, whoa, whoa, well, I mean, I got a lot of questions. I'm glad. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. <laughs> well, what happens if? Man, I don't know. Well, what about? I don't know. God doesn't often give you step two until you've taken step one. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow, this is a come on, somebody, tomorrow will be anxious enough for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Can I tell you why a lot of Christians don't take the step that they know that they need to take? Because they're worried about the next day. And God says, anxiety will take care of that, and I will take care of that. I just need you to do what I've called you to do. I just need you to stop doing the thing that you know you shouldn't be doing. I just need you to start doing the thing that you know you should be doing. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, right now. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so I want to give you a moment just to do some business with God. Can we do that? I'm going to have you pack up your stuff. I'm going to have you kind of get quiet before him. And I'm going to ask you to get clarity on one of three things. And I'm going to ask you to respond. How many of you in here today, no one looking around but me, would say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's things that I'm doing that God wants me to stop? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Yeah, there are things that, they're even good things, they just aren't the best things. I need to stop. How many of you, there are things that I should be doing that I'm not? Okay, I do want you to look around. This room is full of people that God has vision for this church about that we're not stepping into. And I want you to think about the beauty of a church that says, I'll just take this step with that many hands raised. Okay, close your eyes again. <laughs> I want you to think before you answer this one. How many of you would say, I don't know how it's going to look. I don't exactly know how to do it. But between God and I, I'm going to say that today, I'm going to make that decision. I'm going to make that decision to stop doing that thing or to start doing that thing. I'm going to have that conversation. I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to write that check. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Wow. Okay, hands all over the room. And here's what I'd like you to do. If you feel like you have heard from God on this, then I would like you to either... Tell a friend, or I'd like you to come down after the service and talk to one of our pastors. Because the job of a pastor at Graceway is to help equip you in the ministry that God has called you to. And so if you are beginning to get clarity on what that is, we want to know so that we can come alongside you, empower you, equip you, and help you into the good purposes that God has for you. You receive this today? Hey, Pastor Tim here. I hope that you enjoyed our service. If it was a blessing to you or God spoke to you, I hope that you'll let us know. Shoot us an email at amen at visitgraceway.org. We would love to hear what God's doing in your life and how we might be able to help you in it. If you'd like to support our ministry, you can support us by giving right there. And if you live in the Kansas City area, I hope that you'll stop by and give us a visit. We'd love to shake your hand, buy you a cup of coffee, worship Jesus together. Let us know how we can be of help to you, and I hope to see you soon.